Um, hey everyone, welcome. Um, I, I thought, as I do before all talks, about abandoning slides and just giving a, a chalk talk, but then I didn't know if there would be chalk and I kind of wussed out. So uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can use the slides when we want them and we can go off script. You know, I'm from New York, so if you, if you have any comments, uh, don't wait till the end. You know, you can, if you have a question, shout out or heckle or whatever. Um, <laughs> So um, I was going to do some level setting. Like how many people here uh, work in machine learning a little bit? Some people. How many people here have trained a neural network to do something? It's like a third of the audience. How many people here like, are familiarized with AI through the media? Can we turn the mic down just a tiny bit so I could talk louder? All right, cool. All right, great. So I'll kind of uh, start a little bit high level, um, kind of talk a little bit about you know, what AI and machine learning are and what are exciting things we've been able to do recently that have caused people to get you know, very excited. And then maybe what are also kind of just giant holes in our understanding and current capabilities that people sort of fail to appreciate. Um, try to contextualize a little bit uh, what we actually can do with the conversation that sort of takes place now increasingly like in the media and in policy and in casual conversation about you know, our future technical overlords and how that might square the reality. Um, and then talk a little bit about um, on a more technical dive um, on some of the work that I'm doing, some of the things that I find interesting. And, um, and then I can you know, maybe be patronizing and tell you how to live your life because I'm an old person speaking for an audience of young people and you know, that's appropriate. So um, to start, I can tell you a little bit about myself, um, how I got into machine learning. So I used to play the saxophone and I did that for a long time. And then I got, uh, I don't know, New York was smelly and I didn't have money and uh, it was just time to do something different. And I moved to California in my 2004 Toyota Corolla, and I applied to PhDs, and I did some startup nonsense uh, while I was waiting to hear if I got in. And um, I, I ended up going to UCSD, which is a beautiful kind of idyllic sort of setting. So if anybody's thinking about PhD and likes to surf, um, I didn't actually surf when I got there, but you know I promised that I would. So. Um, I got, I got lucky to sort of be in the right place at the right time. So I got into machine learning at a time when it was probably a little bit easier to go into PhD with absolutely no idea what you were doing than it is now. Now the competition is a little bit stiffer. Um, and I got into it and got interested in deep learning at also right about the right time in like 2013, 2014, when um, suddenly everyone and their father and mother and you know, was super interested in hiring deep learning talent and there wasn't any, so they had to settle for me. And I, I, I worked at Microsoft Research Lab. I spent my first summer of my PhD in India, in Bangalore. Um, I spent my second summer uh, working with uh, Amazon's core machine learning team in Seattle. Um, I spent seven months during PhD. I also, by like a weird twist of fate, wound up like sort of advisor list for a little period of time and I took advantage of that to uh, do whatever I wanted. Um, and so I worked in uh, Microsoft Research in Redmond for about seven months with uh, a little vacation in the middle. Um, then I ended up, at my fourth year of PhD, I ended up uh, getting a faculty offer, which was nice, but I hadn't um, proposed my thesis yet, so I needed to buy some time. So I, uh, uh, I spent a year um, until I could formally graduate as a scientist at Amazon AI, and I still continue to collaborate with that team a bit. And I just joined Carnegie Mellon as a junior faculty. So um, if you have any questions about any of these places. Um, you know, what, one, one I think is the important thing that I would like communicate to a young person about this path or whatever is that uh, it's very easy to um, be like in a huge sort of setting where you feel like you're on a track. You know, I, I felt that when I was a musician in my early career that like you look around, you look over your shoulder and you see all these and I was about 10 years older than a lot of you when I did machine learning for the very first time in my life. And um, it doesn't really matter. Um, and uh, the sort of typical track is boring anyway. 
and uh, like no one cares. Like, like the, the, the barriers to entry are really low. Um, it doesn't matter what your major is. It doesn't matter what your experience is. If you decide you're interested in something and you look around and the people doing it aren't geniuses that like are towering over you uh, and you know, they seem like normal people, then it's something you can do. And uh, you know, there's no such thing as being behind or anything. So if you're interested in machine learning, um, uh, you can get into it whatever you want. So I work in a few different areas. I work on uh, applications of machine learning to healthcare. Um, I'm interested in the, robust list, the robustness of machine learning systems. I'll talk a little bit about why I think that matters. And that informs my work on problems like domain adaptation, where basically you train a system under some data in some that you've collected you know, that maybe isn't perfectly representative of what you're going to see in the future. The future, someone's going to come out with a new microphone or a new camera or you know, cars on the road are going to have a new kind of paint job and you want models that continue to work even when faced with kind of subtle changes in the environment. Um, I work a lot on interactive learning. The idea there is can we uh, build systems that don't require as much data to train if we have humans in the loop, if we can ask the right questions rather than just having to brute force train them on millions and millions of examples. And um, something I'll talk about a bit um, that I want you to all think about, any of you that are actually going to work with machine learning, is that um, all of our machine learning um, kind of sucks. So it's like it's way better than you know any artificial intelligence we had in the past, but it's still it's uh, solving the wrong problems on, with the wrong data. It's asking the wrong questions, and it breaks really easily, uh, especially under the kinds of settings in which you want to deploy these systems. And so when you start um, building your apps to uh, uh, decide who to uh, recommend for jobs or help people do recruiting or uh, get involved in housing or lending or any of the types of things where you might think uh, technology is going to be a panacea, uh, you have to think really critically about sort of your responsibility of deploying technology into these critical settings. And uh, right now machine learning is being used in all kinds of ways where um, people that probably have never thought really hard about uh, the ramifications are, are sort of just putting blind trust in, like say, sort of statistical and ML-based decision-making systems to guide things like predictive policing and uh, deciding who to let out or not on bail because of like risk prediction scores. So um, not everything in life is a prediction problem and understanding where things can go wrong is really important. So if you're interested in these issues, I maintain a blog where I complain about things called approximatelycorrect.com. So to start off, uh, people are really excited about AI. Um, but the word is often used in the discourse kind of broadly as a bit of a wild card. So people say AI is going to be your new boss, AI is going to be your new doctor. Uh, no one's quite sure what they mean by that. Um, so AI doesn't really speak to any specific technology. Or, uh, yeah, there's uh, all kinds of crazy imagery that's associated with AI and it, it means lots of different things to, to different people. Um, there's this weird blue uh, brain that keeps showing up all over the internet. Anytime anyone talks about AI, I still haven't figured out what it means. I think it's like a circuit uh, had a child with a, I don't know, something. <laughs> and um, you know, you, you have a kind of uh, sort of science fiction cinematic idea of what AI is that sort of uh, you know, dominates people's imaginations. Um, artificial intelligence isn't really a specific technology. It's sort of an aspirational kind of word. I think the only, the only definition of the term that I've ever found useful um, it are things sort of along the lines of this quote from Andrew Moore, who until at least uh, recently or maybe until the near future uh, is actually our dean of computer science over at CMU. He said, artificial intelligence is the science and engineering of uh, making computers behave in ways that until recently we thought required human intelligence. So there's a lot packed in there, but uh, among other things that AI speaks both to science and engineering, like one of the big differences between AI researchers and statisticians is that uh, we build things, we're, we're concerned with uh, you know, working systems. Um, it also, this idea of until recently conveys the idea that it's a working target, uh, it's a moving target. And an another important detail here is that it doesn't really speak about any specific technology. So if you go into the 1980s and you uh, try to find an AI group, they're probably either working on expert systems or they're working on tree search. Then you go maybe 1990s, 2000s, suddenly like learning theory gets really hot. Um, a lot of the sort of enthusiasm for expert systems fades, and then you find a bunch of people working on completely different methods, a lot of them some of the same people. Um, so it's sort of an aspirational term, but doesn't actually speak to a specific technology with any specific properties. Um, it speaks more sort of to what our goals are. Then there's machine learning, which is a bit more concrete. 
So this definition that I like came from like a, one of the first textbooks on machine learning by Tom Mitchell. He says that you know, what we want to do is produce algorithms that perform better as a, you know, determined by some kind of metric, some way of measuring their performance as a function of experience. This means we want algorithms that, uh, as we, uh, you know, this could mean experience to mean many things. Most often in the typical machine learning settings, it means getting exposed to more data. But, you know, basically it speaks to that, you know, unlike, say, Deep Blue, which once you, uh, you know, whoever programmed it, programmed it, just performed the same way every single time it played a game of chess, we're interested in systems that, as they keep interacting with the world, are going to get better and better and better. Um, that often that just means that getting exposed to labeled data. So, you know, it's really useful anytime you have a setting where we just don't know how to program a function from scratch. So nobody in the world knows how to write a function that's going to take a snippet of raw audio and write out the text that corresponds to it. But if we can learn from examples, as you see more and more examples, you get better and better and better at learning this function that maps between uh, speech and text, and eventually you have the systems that are working on all of your iPhones right now that are um, actually doing voice transcription. So there's a lot of paradigms in machine learning. Almost all the machine learning actually deployed in the real world is something called supervised learning, where we just try to learn mappings from X to Y, given many, many, many examples and the corresponding labels. We try to sort of um, learn to infer, you know, given an image, uh, what category does it belong to? Given some speech, what's the appropriate text? Given a sentence in English, what's the corresponding sentence in, say, Hindi? Um, and neural networks are just one among many, many um, possible tools for learning these kinds of mappings. So they're just really powerful, flexible, useful function approximators that work really well when you have lots of data. Um, they're only neural in you know, the loosest sense that you know, the original inspiration came from McCulloch and Pitts at MIT in I think like the 40s or 50s, and they were interested in uh, just you know, this idea of what would like, the simplest, most stripped down model of computation look like that you know, loosely based on the brain, and you know, the, what are the little things we know about the brain? Well, they're composed of a bunch of simple uh, processing units that composed together can do some very complicated things that maybe any individual's neuron can't do. So we have these individual artificial neurons, which are just sort of a caricature of a, a biological neuron. They receive some input, and in response to that stimulus, they can either fire or not fire. And you know, just like, um, just like uh, sort of with biological neuron, you can have excitatory or inhibitory synapses. Here, you know, we can have sort of positive or negative weights. Um, so it's just you know. Just a, just a way of parameterizing a function. And deep learning is just a buzzword that we came up with because people stopped accepting our neural network papers for publication. And then like 10 years went by, and then suddenly stuff started working, and we needed a way to like kind of let people know that, um, no, it's, it's, it's different. It's exciting. Um, this, the, 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 maybe the more charitable view is that um, it's not just about a buzzword or a rebranding. It's actually that in the past, if you went back 20 years ago, people did not have success training very large neural networks. Um, so basically, neural networks just have many, many layers of neurons stacked on top of each other. Um, it turns out that we just needed much faster computers. So the learning algorithms are qualitatively almost identical to the stuff we were doing in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the biggest difference is uh, we get more at-bats now. So it turns out that you know, if you took those kinds of models that we used to, say, do Google Translate or something like that, if you tried to train one of those in 1990, and you started the training right then, it would still probably be running right now. Um, but now it turns out that we can repurpose all the uh, hardware that was developed to make your video games go faster and use it instead to do fast linear algebra. And um, you know, the cost of computation has gone down enough that you know, we're able to um, train these big, powerful models. Um, so there have been a lot of huge successes in deep learning. Um, among the kinds of things that we could do right now are things like semantic segmentation, where we're able to, say, feed in like, high-resolution images and get out per-pixel classification, so assignments to the object that we think they belong to. So we're able to say, uh, for you know, these pixels belong to the road, these belong to a car, these belong to the trees, these belong to street signs. Um, something to keep in mind, though, is that you know, these kinds of mappings only work when uh, the data that we encounter in the future looks very similar to the data we've seen in the past. So if all of our photos were taken during the day and then we run our model at night, you'd like to think, well, it'll still kind of work, but the answer is, you know, anybody's guess. Um, we've also been able to repurpose these tools for generative models. So um, we're able to basically use a neural network as a loss function and use it to guide the generative process. This is from a recent paper by NVIDIA, and these are actual not real people. So these are synthetic images that are generated to sort of imitate the, uh, 
you know, uh, basically to try to fool a classifier into thinking that it's a real image. Um, so they came up with a clever training scheme, sort of a curriculum learning based approach, and were able to, um, you know, who knows if we're really learning the distribution, probably not, um, but generate things that are sort of in some way or another compelling enough that maybe the graphics community is suddenly kind of interested and excited and it'll probably become like an Instagram filter. Um, so, the, you know, the, I, I, one thing that's pretty cool about what's going on in deep learning now and why you should be excited about it is that it used to be that if you wanted to work in computer vision, then you were a computer vision person. And if you wanted to work in audio, you were an audio person. You wanted to work in speech, you were specifically a speech person. You wanted to work in uh, natural language translation. Like, th these communities were much more siloed. And it turned out that by far the most important part of doing pattern recognition on any of these tasks was hand engineering features. And hand engineering features meant that you were an expert in that domain. So if you worked in medical stuff, then you knew something about what features were good for classifying different diseases. If you were a speech person, you knew something about which features were good for recognizing phonemes. Um, a powerful thing about these models is basically the same models that are good for recognizing images, very, very similar models that are also convolutional neural networks with many layers and run on GPUs and require the same set of programming skills and sort of basic software tooling for building them, work for speech, they work for translation. Um, and some of my own work, um, some of my earliest work in deep learning was when I was early in my PhD, um, there were all these breakthroughs, uh, learning from sort of these varying length sequences in the context of natural language. And I was interested in seeing, could we use these same tools to operate on the sort of like messy, uh, sort of like real time uh, clinical data that you get from patients in the pediatric intensive care unit. So in this case, instead of getting characters or words that comprise sort of sentences and paragraphs, um, what we have instead are these multivariate time series of uh, medical data, and we're interested in doing things like um, predicting which diagnoses apply to a given patient, recognizing length of stay, uh, predicting you know, who's going to die and who's not going to die, or what's the probability that someone once released from the hospital is going to be readmitted in the near future. So these kinds of severity scores are useful for deciding you know, who to release, who to escalate, you know, triage to a higher level of care, et cetera. And because I did my PhD in San Diego, I also dabbled in modeling beer reviews. So uh, as an example of the kind of um, power of these models to um, learn pretty complex patterns, this is a case where what we did was we thought, well, how does a traditional recommender system work? It takes uh, a user and an item and tries to predict what rating would this user give to that item. And so we thought, instead of trying to predict the rating, which is a little bit boring, let's say, can we actually compose the review that this user would leave for this item? So um, my advisor in his uh, postdoc had, um, at that time, had scraped, a, he had worked a lot on modeling uh, product reviews and rating prediction, and he's famous, among other things, for scraping the entirety of Amazon.com. And uh, um, among his uh, exploits there, he also uh, scraped all the data out of some sites called Rate Beer and uh, BeerAdvocate.com. So here, these people are extreme, just weird losers who uh, are, they just get drunk every night. And then they write like, some of them, like the most prolific people write like three reviews of beers per day. So, you know, you do the math, but it's not looking good for their livers. Um, <laughs> So uh, these people, they tend to have a pretty, because they write so many beer reviews, they get a little bit you know, stiff and uh, kind of don't have such, uh, so much variance in their writing style. They tend to maybe even have like a, maybe each user tends to sort of have a basic template or formula to how they write their reviews. There are some kind of community norms, like people tend to write their reviews talking about the appearance, smell, taste, mouthfeel, and drinkability of each beer but they don't uh, necessarily all demarcate these sections in the same way or in the precise same order. Um, so in this case, what we've done is we've trained a model that says, uh, this is the user and this is the item and tries to model, sort of learn what we call like a density model or like a conventional language model. Um, in this case, it's conditioned on knowing the identity of the user and the item that they're rating. Uh, they try to predict, you know, what's the probability of each sequence of text that might come out and then you could sample from this to generate a uh, review. Um, so in this case, on the left is the actual real review that a user wrote about a given beer, and on the right is the review that our system, which has never actually seen this user beer combination before, predicts that this user would leave for this beer. So you see it actually, it learns precisely what is this person's style, it also learns some characteristics of the beer. So it knows that it's got a golden color, so maybe it's like a lager or an IPA. It knows that it has a person likes to talk about the white head and the lacing that it leaves on the glass. And um, likes to lead off the review uh, talking about uh, what sort of cup did they pour it out of and what sort of cup did they pour it into. Um, you know, exciting stuff. 
Um, so you might think like, hey, we, we, we used to be only able to you know, fit lines, and now we can fit uh, you know, sequence to sequence models, and we can fit these like, you know, natural image models. So like, you know, within a year or two, we're going to solve AGI, and we're all, gonna, we're all going to be enslaved by the robot army. But it, it's, it's worth pointing out that being really good at one thing doesn't make you good at something else. So it's like if you, if you learn to run and you get really fast and you get faster and you get faster and you get faster and you get faster, you're not going to wake up one day and be a lot smarter. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So um, being really good at function fitting doesn't necessarily mean that you're really good at reasoning. And so there's whole blind spots in sort of our current approach to AI. And so on one hand, it's really exciting that we're really good at prediction. On the other hand, there are just inherent limitations to what you could do with a predictive model. Uh, that's all it's doing is modeling correlations in the training data, right? So among the big things that are sort of holes in what's capable, you know, with machine learning right now, is that one, deep learning and, you know, our systems we're excited about require huge amounts of data, sometimes prohibitively much data for the kinds of applications where we would like to use it. Um, our models make predictions, but what we actually use them for is to take actions. And there's a mismatch between what the model's trained to do and how we actually use it. Right? So the model maybe is very good at predicting uh, which user would click on which item. It doesn't mean that that's a good policy for deciding which item you should show to which user. And it doesn't say anything about when you start recommending things to people uh, based on this thing that you just happened to be the label you had lying around, how is that going to influence people's behavior and cause all kinds of weird feedback loops? The model doesn't actually know about its interaction with the world. It doesn't even know there is a world. All it knows is that it's good at predicting ratings or predicting who's going to click on stuff. So when Facebook uh, decides who is it going, you know, which news is it going to show you, it's just trying to predict things like what's the probability that you're going to like, what's the probability that you're going to comment, uh, what's the amount of time you're going to spend lingering on something. It doesn't know if you're lingering because it's high quality content or because it's racist or because it's uh, stupid or because it's poorly spelled and so you're spending more time because uh, it's hard to read. It doesn't know why, it just knows that this was what you told it to predict. And you're trying to predict. It, it, no, one sells, no one tells you a priori, like, this is the right thing to predict. And no one tells you that if you deploy a system into the world that recommends content in this kind of way, that it's not going to lead to horrible things like Donald Trump becoming your president. So, um, so you know, the system doesn't know why um, a label applies. You know, so, so we train systems that are really good at, say, recognizing objects and images. It doesn't know. Uh, necessarily that the bird is the thing with the wings that is flying. It, it might know that uh, when you have blue sky in the background, it's probably a picture of a bird. And um, there's nothing sort of in the current way of training systems that forces them to focus on the difference that makes a difference. Um, it just finds correlations wherever they exist. Um, so I have a good friend. He's now the head of um, the new uh, Google AI lab in Africa, in Accra. Um, his name is Mustafa Sisse, and he had a paper recently uh, that showed that if you take a neural network and you show it a picture of an East Asian man uh, in a red shirt, it will say ping pong ball. <laughs> now, it's not any neural network is guaranteed to do this, but it's because neural networks uh, that are widely used for just sort of generic object recognition tasks are trained on the ImageNet data set. The ImageNet data set has a thousand pictures of man, it has a thousand pictures of ping pong ball. These are formed mostly by scraping Google image search and then having mechanical Turk workers confirm that you know, the object of interest is actually what's in the uh, photo. So what's happening here is just that, well, out of the 1,000 men, maybe there's a bias to maybe have mostly white men, mostly whatever, and maybe there's like, you know, 20, 30 Asian men in the pictures that are labeled man, but then there's many, many, many uh, East Asian men in the photos that are labeled ping pong ball just because of the biases in the training set. So this is a correlation, but this is not a definition. And the models don't know about definitions, they don't know about causality, and they don't know about semantics. So when you deploy this model into the world, um, you, know, you have to think about what's sort of the potential ramifications of having systems that uh, don't actually know what task they're supposed to be performing, uh, especially once the correlations that are potentially spurious that exist in your data set uh, don't actually hold in reality. Um, sort of to that end, these models break under distribution shift. So distribution shift means um, just that somehow the data you see in the future doesn't quite have the exact same distribution as the data you saw in the past. Maybe the fraction of examples belonging to each label changes. Um, maybe there's some kind of superficial change, like you recorded the audio using a slightly different microphone that has a slightly different noise signature, and suddenly uh, all of your speech recognition breaks. 
In reality, people try to deal with this by just constantly labeling new data and uh, hoping for the best. Um, and you know, responding when the PR group at their company gets some like complaint that their system's doing something horrible. Um, reinforcement learning seems like it should address some of these things, like dealing with actions versus predictions. On the other hand, um, it requires that we actually know the right value function that we're trying to optimize. And these systems in general, like AlphaGo or the Atari systems that Google uses to sort of play uh, uh, these like toy games, um, they're really exciting, they're really interesting, but they require tens of millions of examples often to learn good policies. Um, and again, uh, if a lot of these problems feel like they require us to do something deeper involving, say, knowledge of causality and sort of underlying mechanisms, but at the same time, that science is still sort of very early days. So that's why you should go do a PhD and ask the kind of question that might not have an answer in the next, you know, four or five years. So basically, you know, I think a good criticism of what we're doing right now is what we're doing is curve fitting. So um, uh, we are, um, the, the, the positive spin on it is that uh, sort of no one anticipated that we could do so much with just curve fitting. And at the same time, um, the downside is that's what it is. And we're not gonna magically, by doing better curve fitting, suddenly have like emergent properties. Um, so I'm excited about, you know, sort of a few areas where I think are, are rooms to sort of areas to make like kind of impactful progress. One is to develop systems that are more robust, that um, do know the difference that makes a difference. and um, that are sort of invariant to things that we want our model to be invariant to, um, to build models that don't require as much data to train, so when invariably we find that our model sucks, we can improve it. Um, and also to think really critically about the ways that we use technology in the world and to understand the kind of mismatch between what we're doing when we train these systems and the sort of like real world desiderata of like the, you know, the underlying um, you know, human systems to which we're deploying this technology and to sort of better characterize sort of ways to effectively regulate the technology um, to characterize its impacts and ultimately to be able to make judgment calls about when we shouldn't be using it all in the first place. Um, so against this sort of complex picture of exciting capabilities and um, also sort of like critical drawbacks, but problems, you shouldn't get demoralized by problems. Problems are great. If there weren't problems, you wouldn't have a job. So if you want to you know, have a career in research, you should view this as like a huge opportunity and you know, your eyes should light up when you hear that there's a problem. Um, you know, if these things were solved, like there's a lot of exciting things that have been solved and you, know, you, don't, you, know, you, can't, you can't reinvent things that have been invented and you can't uh, fix problems that have already been cured. So you know, if, you, if you're born in 2018 and you want to cure polio, it's too late. Um, but if you want to cure uh, malfunctioning AI, then like, this is your time. You know, so against this environment, you know, you're, you're sort of surrounded by this nonstop 24-7 media blitz of BS. Um, so you're hearing stories about, you know, technology that uh, is sort of personified, these stories about robots. The recent one is Sophie the robot. Before that, there was Erica the robot. For some reason, there are always these weird, creepy dudes who make these, like, subservient, like, female robots that uh, speak in a creepy voice uh, and read off a script. But the media presents it as though they, like, have autonomy. Um, you have this sort of... Uh, you know, sort of self-promoting uh, kind of billionaires who sort of insert themselves into the conversation as though they're sort of intellectual authorities and uh, sort of try to shape the narrative around their sort of like corporate goals. Uh, and then you have like a bunch of people making prophecies about what's going to happen, you know, way in the year 2000 um, or, you know, 2045 or whatever it is, you know, and the singularity is going to come. And these things are discussed sort of interchangeably with scientific facts as though they are sitting on kind of similar footing and should be discussed as like similarly pressing concerns. You know, a bunch of companies just have like full-time PR units just pouring, you know, BS all over um, every single story that comes out. I think IBM is one of the worst offenders. Um, you know, basically they had a Jeopardy playing robot that did a really good job of beating Ken Jennings. And ever since then, uh, everything that the company does is called Watson. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's a huge danger here. There's a huge danger, actually, I think, that even like threatens young people in this career who want to uh, say have an impact in these areas. Say I want to use machine learning for healthcare. I want to use machine learning for healthcare, and I'm try to be reasonably responsible about it. But when someone goes out and says we're going to cure cancer in five years, but if you give us all of your data, because Watson is going to use a super intelligence to do it, then there's a huge danger that when uh, when that promise goes unfulfilled, that there will be a backlash. Um, so you know, if you work for a company and your PM wants to put out stories like this and wants to make promises like this to your clients, you should slap them. 
<laughs> I'm not advocating violence, it's a metaphor. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have this kind of huge divergence between the discussion of AI, the actual capabilities, um, and overall, you know, I, I think it's something that you have to think about, you know, maybe to like jump off a little bit off the last talk, which kind of spoke about your responsibilities in terms of ethics. You know, I, I think there, there's a weird thing where scientists are often pretty quiet. Um, you know, we were quiet during the Vietnam War. Um, uh, that was maybe a little bit different because, I mean, and, and not to say that it's any forgivable, but like we were not the primary drivers of the conflict maybe as technologists, but we, we really are the primary drivers of problems that are technology centered. We sort of, we tend to be um, relatively underrepresented in politics and we tend to um, often avoid the press, especially uh, if you work at a big company, they'll probably muzzle you and not let you talk to the press. Um, but we have an obligation, I think, to actually uh, speak in a sober way about what we're doing and to kind of set the record straight and to, and to not kind of um, sort of tell lies even when they help sell our startups. Um, so, you know, we, we're, right now there's this huge gap between, you know, when you have a lot of excited people and they're also ignorant, then there's a, you know, there's a lot of fools who are ready to be taken and there's a lot of people who are all too eager to sort of step into the fray and sort of self-promote and, uh, you know, anoint themselves as AI influencers and kind of spin any kind of hype in the direction that helps them, but it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, contribute positively. And you have a responsibility as someone working in the field not to, to sort of like collect your paycheck and keep quiet. Um, so, you know, ultimately, you know, we should care about these things because, uh, um, you know, politicians, you know, don't, don't read the scientific literature, but they do read puff pieces, they do read Twitter. Um, your bosses, your corporate bosses who won't know how the technology you're building actually works, you know, are, are governed by the same kind of uh, sort of shallow understanding. And ultimately, you know, you have some responsibility to enter there. Um, so I'd like to talk about now is how much time do I have? Like 20 minutes or something? Yeah, so what I'd like to talk about now is, is some of the concrete technical problems that I'm working on um, to address a couple of these different problems. Um, so in particular, I, I mentioned that machine learning systems break under distribution shift, right? So for example, if you collect a whole bunch of images from say a self-driving car and you use them to train a vision system, um, imagine that you collect them from, you, I don't know if you guys are young enough to, or, or old enough, old enough? To remember a system, like to remember those like Mercedes, used to always have these, uh, these little pendants that stuck up above the hood, you know, before the new ones where they just have it like tucked into the, the grill. Anyway, imagine that you go and collect a whole bunch of images like this with a Mercedes, which have the little pendant in all the photographs, and you, you, know, have, a, you have a camera uh, shooting through your windshield, and you collect a bunch of images, and then you annotate them for semantic segmentation, and you're hoping that you're gonna build a self-driving car using a vision system that's trained on the images that you've collected. And you train it, and you say, I got 94% accuracy, or 98% accuracy, or whatever, like, this is awesome. We're gonna, you know, solve the AI singularities around the corner, and we're gonna make some, you know, self-driving billions. And then, um, your self-driving car, one day, uh, while it's parked, somebody knocks off the pendant. And the question is, what's gonna happen to your computer vision system? Is it gonna continue to work? Is it gonna mostly work, but not in the region, you know, of the image that corresponds to the Mercedes pendant? Any idea? The answer is nobody knows. You have no certificate. All that you measure is that the accuracy is good under the training distribution. This is the kind of system we have. If the future data is sampled completely independently from the exact same population that generated the data that we used to fit these machine learning systems, everything will be fine. If it doesn't, then all bets are off, but we're probably gonna die. <laughs> um, so, so this should be like really unsatisfying because the real world is actually always changing and the real future data that you encounter um, never comes from the exact same distribution as the data that you use to train your model. So in a sense, it seems like things are pretty hopeless. And indeed, actually it's like in general, as I've stated it so far, this is an impossible problem. Um, so if, if, the, if the data, if I just say the data that I've seen in the past, data I'm gonna see in the future are different, there's nothing you could do. Um, but fortunately, if you make just a few small assumptions or a few big assumptions, uh, there often is a way out. So um, the, well, what I'll talk about now is, is some research where we, we focus on one specific case of the way that things could change between training time and test time and um, sort of how we came up with a solution. So 
Imagine that you train a predictor, which just basically is going to say, does someone have pneumonia or not? All right, so this is kind of like our motivation driving this research. So we say, we're going to train a pneumonia predictor. And let's say that like 0.05% of people have pneumonia. So we train uh, the predictor, and it says, OK, I think 0.05% of people are positive for pneumonia. We say, great. Then we run it on our validation data. It also predicts roughly 0.05% of people. It seems it's reasonably accurate, maybe not perfect, but it's pretty good. We run it in the wild, and it seems to be predicting roughly the same percentage of the population has pneumonia, say based on like images of their chest x-rays or something like that. So we think, hey, we've got a good system. So that's, say, like January. Oh, August, sorry. Then, uh, you know, January comes along, and we run our classifier on randomly sampled x-rays that are coming through the clinic in January. And suddenly, let's say it tells us that 5% of the population has pneumonia. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. Probably it wouldn't go up by a factor of 100, but you get the idea. Um, we might think like, hey, awesome. We trained a classifier to recognize pneumonia, and it recognized pneumonia. And it recognized that there was a change. So like, we, that's what we would presumably wanted our classifier to do, to sort of like do public health, quantify you know, the amount of disease. Uh, it gave us a prediction. We've detected the outbreak. Like, Great job. Um, on the other hand, um, why, why should we maybe not believe that 5% of the population has pneumonia? We're not all in quarantine. You're not, we're not all running through COVID. Well, we could be, you know, in fictional January. It's only September now. We could be detecting like, things similar to pneumonia that are also now more common. So that's one possibility. Um, what if you even lived in a world where there were only two states, you either had pneumonia or not pneumonia, there were no other diseases? Even then, you shouldn't trust a classifier. Like one reason why you shouldn't trust a classifier is that your classifier makes good predictions in the world in which 0.05% of people have pneumonia. So it's trained under a prior. If in, if in the real world, 5% of people have pneumonia, that means that your data distribution is different. And under the new prior, your classifier is no longer going to be accurate. So um, you can come up with many like, kind of complicated ways that this could go wrong and you shouldn't trust your classifier. But even if you don't, even in the world where literally all that's changed is more people have pneumonia, like in a world where the only thing that could possibly have changed is the rate of pneumonia has changed, you still shouldn't trust your classifier. Your model's trained on the population, right? You don't train your model, you train your model on a collection of individuals which are sampled from some population. And that population has some distribution, right? So um, there are some things that occur in your training data, there are some things that don't occur in your training data, there are some things that occur more often, there are some things that occur less often. And what you're trying to minimize, when you fit the parameters of your model to make good predictions, what you're trying to minimize is some aggregate measure of performance that's calculated as a sum over all of your training examples, right? So if I say I collect uh, data on a million people, then what I'm trying to do is when I, when I tweak all the knobs in my model to try to fit the model, I'm trying to make the model that on average performs best across those million people, right? And then I'm going to evaluate it on a random partition that was held out. Um, but if I counter new data in the future, so, so you're training it, you know, the data for each row in your table, right, corresponds to a different individual. But um, the, the average, the, the ultimate objective that you're measuring is an average over the individuals that you have. And so the ratio of different types of individuals matters. It's going to affect what function you end up learning. So um, right. In, in general, basically, our, if our distributions are different, I already sort of told you we, we, in general, can't trust our classifier anymore. So we, we, it was sort of, we were sort of in this like paradox, right? Of like, not really a paradox, but it's like you train your classifier, you're hoping that you're going to use it to detect that there's a difference, but then if there actually is a difference, you can no longer trust what comes out of your classifier. Yeah? I was going to ask, um, if models that do not perform as well uh, when they're given like a different like, class distribution, then why should people be upset when we have one class that does much well than the um, It's not clear that that's well guided most of the time. Okay. Um, so. You know, they might, they might try to stabilize training or something. Like if you, if you had a, 
a billion examples and you were trying to recognize something that only occurred one in a million times and you might try to upsample but then correct by using like importance weights and then downscale the importance of the loss to like stabilize training or make things converge faster or something like that. Um, but it's uh, in, the, in general when people sort of do class rebalancing during training I think a lot of the time they haven't actually thought about what they are doing. And I found that most people if you get right down to it don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. Right, which is what you do every time you deploy a machine learning model, right? If you're using Google Translate, you've collected a whole bunch of data from the past, you've learned some kind of mapping, and then you're deploying it tomorrow. And you're never training it on data from the future because that's not possible yet. And you're only, and you're not training on data from the present because, you know, like it just takes too long to train a model. You're training it on data that's probably at least a few months stale. So I'm telling you is our systems are, are not actually reliable. Um, it's just we, we hope. And, and in general, they work worse, right? How many people use uh, voice transcription on your phone? So if you go and talk to like some people who are not critical enough in like speech, they might tell you we're at super level, we're at superhuman level speech recognition now. If you actually use the speech recognition on your phone, then you're acutely aware that we are not at superhuman level speech recognition. So what do they mean? What, what is superhuman? What's superhuman is if you take the training set that they trained on, you know, if, you, if you take the data set that they had access to at training time and you split it, a completely random partition, into training and test splits, and you train on the training split and evaluate on the test split, then it's going to get a good job of phoneme recognition, maybe comparable to what humans get, probably on the art of, probably not even on like whole sentence recognition, but like on the you know, micro task of like individual phoneme recognition. But then once you actually get to like humans' ability to put together what's going on in a block of text, and you actually go into the fact that your model uh, was trained on relatively cleaner data and you're actually using your uh, phone to try to recognize speech outside and in the car and with the radio in the background and all kinds of settings in which humans perform, it actually is not nearly as reliable. So basically our systems perform much worse in the real world. And in some cases, like on speech recognition, you know, it's not, nobody's life is at stake necessarily. They don't make a contract that says, you know, if it breaks, uh, we're going to take responsibility for uh, something. And, well, it's, you don't have an alternative, right? So, but in general, it's not as reliable. It, doesn't, it performs worse in the real world than it does sort of in the lab. And ultimately, what we want is systems that perform a lot better outside the sandbox and not just inside the sandbox. So the core problem that we have here is something called domain adaptation. It says we basically get a bunch of labeled data, or call our training data, from some source distribution. But then in the future, we're going to get uh, examples that are unlabeled that are from what we call target distribution. And we want to learn a model that does well in a target distribution without ever seeing labels from the target distribution, right? So like I, I train the system, I have the training data where I have labels for it, um, I train it, I can evaluate it, I think it's doing pretty good, and then I'm gonna deploy it and then suddenly I'm gonna start getting a whole bunch of data that's coming in live from the environment. And um, that data is not labeled and yet I want to somehow, um, ultimately my goal is to perform well in this unlabeled data for which I've never actually seen labels before. So I want to somehow adapt my model from just using the naive thing is I could just use my training, you know, my model that I train on the training data and just use it on the test data and hope for the best. What I'd really like to do is say, can I somehow use this unlabeled training data that's coming in in real time and adapt my model to do better? Um, so actually that's impossible. It's sort of trivial to show that it's impossible um, that if you don't make any additional assumptions, if you just say my training and target data are different from each other, um, there's no way to like reliably, you know, sort of prove, you could just say, you know, God is angry at us and he's going to, in the future, decide that cats look like dogs and dogs look like cats now. Um, so um, we have to make some kind of additional assumption in order to make this work. So uh, there's lots of different assumptions you can make, but since we're motivated by um, the flu example, I'm going to make, uh, it turns out what assumption you can make is uh, often uh, influenced by what you know about the environment, right? So um, one, one thing that you can assume is that um, our distribution is going to factorize. So anyone knows any basic probability knows that you can factorize a joint distribution into the product of uh, a marginal and conditional distribution. And um, 
Now, which one? Uh, you, one thing you could do is you could assume that one of the conditional probabilities stays the same. So if you assume that the probability of the label given the input stays the same, that is called the covariate shift assumption. Um, in this case, we're actually interested in the opposite assumption, which is that basically the probability of the input given the label changes. And the reason why, which you can't get too deep into, is that these different assumptions about which con conditional probability stays the same are informed by uh, uh, assumptions about the underlying causal structure. So the question is, does x cause y or does y cause x? So if we believe the flu causes the symptoms, then um, that's going to lead to this assumption that the probability of x given y stays the same. If we believe that the symptoms cause the diagnosis, um, so, so, so a case where the, we think our inputs might cause the, the outputs would be, say, forecasting. Right? The, the, the past always causes the future, as far as I know. Um, on the other hand, if we believe that you know, the, the thing we're trying to predict is the cause, and the evidence that we have are the effects, then this corresponds to the anti-causal assumption. And the right thing to assume is that there is this uh, fixed um, class conditional uh, probability. So basically, um, what we want to do is we want to detect that a shift has occurred. We want to estimate the new label distribution. So what we're assuming is basically the, the label distribution has changed. The percentage of people with the flu has changed. And we want to accurately estimate it. And we know that our classifier's output might not be the accurate estimate, but we still want to recover the accurate estimate anyway. And ultimately, what we'd like to do is once we have that accurate estimate, we can actually go back and use either some kind of clever plug-in rule, or we can retrain our classifier using something called importance-weighted risk minimization. And then we can get out um, uh, an updated classifier that's going to do a good job on future data. And we need to be able to do all this without seeing new labels. So an intuition is that we actually know this is possible. Humans are demonstrated to have this ability. So uh, there's a paper um, called the test item effect. And um, you can think of it this way, right? Say that like you were 70% good at distinguishing between cats and dogs. So um, now if you then suddenly encounter a data set that has 10,000 images, and they're all cats, uh, you think, um, basically, if you just apply your classifier naively, you're going to keep getting 70% accuracy. Even though, and, you know, before, it was half dogs, half cats, so 70% was like a better than random accuracy, but now, in the world that consists only of cats, uh, getting 70% accuracy is pretty lousy, because you would get 100% accuracy just by saying all cats. Um, so, Basically, you could think like if you're um, in this room, if you suddenly like were 70% good at in, you know distinguishing between any two objects, let's say you know weebles and squeebles, and then you found yourself in a room that had only squeebles, uh, you think you'd be like, well, weeble, weeble, you know, whatever, squeeble, 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 weeble, squeeble, squeeble, and then you suddenly be like, you know what, I'm I find myself predicting a lot of squeebles. Um, maybe there's more squeebles than there were in my training set. You would update your sort of like prior probability, and then based on your updated prior probability, you could now in real time start making better predictions without anyone giving you some like direct supervised uh, feedback. Um, so we need a few assumptions. We need this assumption that the uh, p of x given y is equal to q of x given y. There's not enough time to get into all the details here. We need to assume that basically the labels that we encounter in the future are going to be a subset of the labels that we've seen in the past. Um, and we need access to some black box predictor about which we're not going to really um, make any kind of strong assumptions. And it turns out that there is um, a relationship between the confusion matrices of our classifier, which are, you know, sort of relate uh, the actual class that an image belongs to, to the probability that our classifier, you know, of which class it predicts. It turns out that if we, if, we, if, we length normal, if we normalize the columns of these matrices, then the normalized matrix, even though the original confusion matrix is not the same on the source and target distribution, the normalized one is the same. And if we look at that together with our classifier's average output on the target data, uh, these things turn out to form a linear system, and the solution to the linear system actually gives us a, a, a consistent estimator of our test set label distribution. So in this case, this is like the probability that someone has the flu. Um, so, uh, and, and it turns out this, this estimator um, has this nice error bound, which basically says, as I've seen, as the number of images I've seen uh, in training that I used to estimate the confusion matrix gets really large, and as the number of uh, test examples that I have access to that don't have any labels gets really large, my error at estimating the test set label distribution is going to converge to zero. Um, so you can get arbitrarily good as long as you see lots of data. Um, so 
there's not enough time to really get into all the details and I don't want you to, you know, I don't expect you to fully understand everything about what's going on here. The point is to say, um, you know, there, there's a lot of these problems where there's something wrong with what our systems do. And if you think really hard about it and you carve out, you say you're very clear about, it. there's a lot of papers now in deep learning that say they're addressing domain adaptation, but if you actually start reading the paper, you realize the authors have no idea what they're talking about and they haven't um, specified under what assumptions it works or doesn't work. And it turns out the problem as stated is impossible uh, and sort of like trivially shown to be. But if you, you know, if you dig into any of these problems deeply enough, there, there, there often is a solution. And, and I think there's um, work to be done, perhaps work that you know, uh, might not pay off in like the next two weeks, but perhaps in the next you know, two months. <laughs> um, so you know, um, I've also done a bunch of work on how to use human in the loop uh, learning to make models better. Um, we've shown some things like that for certain NLP tasks, we're able to get models that get, you know, approach sort of the performance of say like the best named entity recognition systems using maybe uh, one quarter the amount of data and to get close to, or I guess in this case around 99% of performance. Um, how to learn from partial feedback, so how to learn from humans in the loop when they can't necessarily tell you exactly what class every image belongs to, but they can give you some kind of uh, soft feedback like this prediction is wrong or that's a dog, but they can't tell you what kind of dog. So, um, you know, there, there's too much to cover here, um, but, you know, I get to give you advices now. And so, uh, one thing I would say is, uh, you know, I think everyone is like on a schedule and you all have like your internships happen at a certain time and PhD applications happen at a certain time and it might seem like uh, you have to be keeping pace or you have to worry about, um, you know, where your peers are and it's all nonsense, and it's all a lie, and uh, you shouldn't worry about it. And if anything, I'd say um, you should try to have different experiences than your peers. Uh, if you want to have an interesting career, uh, one of the best ways to do it is to not uh, have the exact same experiences as everyone else. This will qualify you, you know, whatever, whatever kind of freak you become, you will, be, um, you, will, you will dominate your corner of, you know, the market for your kind of freak. Um, uh, there's a lot, uh, I, I think when you get out of school, uh, it seems cr like it's like overwhelming. It's like so cool that people are going to pay you a lot of money to like be a programmer or a computer scientist or whatever. Um, you guys are graduating from a great school, and you guys are very skilled. Um, those jobs are never going to go away, uh, and every job that you do is going to pay you more money than you actually need. And 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 I, I wouldn't, you know, I've seen so many people sort of like throw away like promising. Um, talent and whatever to work on something really boring that they don't actually care about only to find out like five years later that like moving like the ad box five pixels to the left is not exciting. Um, you, can be, you can be choosy. And so I mean if, if intellectual work is your thing then you know find a job that will actually let you ask interesting questions and, and spend time trying to answer them and you know um, that exists now. It even exists in industry now. Um, I think, you know, try to, try to check that you're, that you're asking real questions and working on real problems and that you're sort of investing your time in like developing your actual skills. And uh, yeah, you know, th th there's, no, there's no reason to be bored um, unless you're just always bored. Can't help you. Um, and in generally, you know, try to, try, to, try to think critically about what you're doing and, you know, find the sort of job that'll let you do that. So I'm happy to answer any questions or hang out or whatever. But you know, nice chatting with you. And uh, um, so we'll do like questions outside.